Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so for the next 30 minutes, I will, while I am putting you to sleep, um, I'm going to talk uh, about a quantitative microbial risk assessment process um, that I use to estimate uh, the infectious risks in residential populations that might be uh, living near a center pivot operation that's spraying dairy wastewater. Um, for a little bit of background, um, the impetus for this work um, occurred a few years ago when an environmental group in Idaho submitted a petition to the Idaho State Department of Agriculture to ban um, wastewater irrigation events, spray irrigation events of dairy wastewater. So um, the spoiler alert is that eventually the state threw out the petition uh, because of the, my research and some other um, information that they obtained during this period. So um, some of you may not know that the land of potatoes is the third largest dairy state in the nation. Um, the cow herd size right now is 580,000. And since that has grown fourfold since 1980. And about 70% of the cows um, are currently located in the Magic Valley area, which is in South Central Idaho. So unfortunately or fortunately, how you look at this, cows produce a lot of manure. Um, average cow is producing 58 kilograms of manure per day. In South Central Idaho, that means there are 23 million kilograms of manure being produced every year. Um, wastewater wise, I can't tell you the volume, but there's uh, a lot of wastewater also generated. So um, wastewater is a combination of manure liquids. It could be flush waters from the milking parlors, um, from lanes, etc., and it can also be rot, uh, lot runoff. Um, in a water-limited environment, such as Idaho, where everything is irrigated, okay, there's no natural rain-fed agriculture, um, it's, it's a very valuable source of irrigation water, and it can also be a source of uh, crop nutrients. But I'll be careful when I say this, it's somewhat of a disposal technique also because a lot of the dairymen are applying the wastewater um, when there are no crops, uh, late season, and so forth. So um, it is also somewhat of a uh, disposal technique. So unfortunately, um, a lot of the wastewaters that, sorry, I think this thing is getting out of control. Um, are not treated prior to, this is pretty frustrating, okay. Can you use the microphone? What's that? I'll, 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 use, use, I'll use the mic. Goodbye. Yep, thank you. Yep. Okay. okay. Here we go. Unfortunately, a lot of the wastewaters are not treated prior to land application, and there is a potential risk of exposure to uh, pathogens in the wastewaters. And um, you can find a variety of bacteria, virus, and protozoa um, in those waters, wastewaters. And as in Idaho, where we have some resistance to center pivot irrigation of dairy wastewater, um, in other states such as Wisconsin, um, there is resistance uh, to using these techniques to um, disperse, dispose of uh, dairy wastewater. Now here is a conceptual model of human infection from land application of wastewater. And I'll just kind of walk you through it quickly. Um, so during a center pivot irrigation event, um, small droplets generally evaporate and aerosolize, or I should say aerosolize and evaporate. Um, they're dispersed, um, assuming there's a receptor downwind, um, they could be inhaled, and there's a potential risk of infection. Um, they also can be deposited and the aerosol particles here we can land on produce, fomites, etc. And those can be ingested and once again we end up here. Um, 
and larger droplets, larger than 150 micrometers, can directly just deposit on produce and fomycin. Of course, we go back to that um, route there to risk of infection. But I'm going to focus right here. Um, the quantitative microbial risk assessment just focused on um, inhalation and then subsequent ingestion of pathogens. So a quantitative microbial risk assessment generally consists of five different components. So I'll, I'll walk through these, so basically starting with hazard identification, exposure assessment, then it's followed by dose response, risk characterization, and then a uh, risk management. So in the next few slides, I'll just pretty much follow the procedure um, and they'll coincide with um, each of these different components. So for hazard identification, um, identified about five different bacterial pathogens, Campylobacter jejuni, E. coli 0157, and non-0157, Listeria, uh, monocytogens, and salmonella. And based on uh, my personal research um, of 30 different dairy wastewaters, um, I found that the concentration of these bacteria range from 10 to the third to 10 to the six cells per 100 mils of wastewater. And I'll just point out that I use quantitative PCR um, for quantitation. So for exposure assessment model, um, it's a pretty straightforward um, model where D is the number of pathogens per dose, EC is the airborne pathogen concentration, and so that was determined using a dispersion model, and I used the US EPA model, AirMod. Uh, the breathing rate was set to 0.61 cubic meters of air per hour, and that's based on um, adult breathing rate, uh, adults greater than 21 years of age, both male and female um, average. And time of exposure, T, um, I set to one hour, eight or 24 hours, of continuous exposure or a multi-day event one hour per day for seven days and I also I utilized a, an ingestion rate of 0 0.1 that means that 10 percent of the bacteria that were inhaled and caught in the nasal mucosa were ingested for dose response model I use the beta poisson model um, where PI is the probability of infection based on a one-time pathogen exposure. D is the pathogen dose. Alpha and beta are the dose response factors, um, and I obtained those from the literature. And then for the multi-day event, I use this um, equation right there, where N is the number of days per year. So I'll just run you through the dispersion model setup. So as I mentioned, I use AirMod. It's a steady state dispersion model. Um, it's, I guess you could say it's been validated for distances up to 50 kilometers. Um, the area source um, I used was a 396 meter by 15 meter um, rectangle to mimic the droplet pattern from a center pivot with 94 flat plate sprinklers. Um, each sprinkler was set at a flow of 34 liters per minute. I had receptors placed at one, two, four, up to 10 kilometers from the pivot uh, with 10 degrees of separation. Um, so I have 250 total receptors in the grid. Um, and I also used five years of meteorological data, but I only used April through October data since that is the uh, irrigation season for center pivot. Here's just a quick picture of the receptor setup. So a hypothetical um, center pivot here, and then you can see the uh, polar grid where the receptor, each red dot is a receptor. So I had to develop pathogen emission rates for use in AirMod, and this is um, pretty much how I went about it. I, developed or came up with four different scenarios. So A, B, C, and D from low risk to very high risk. The total flow rate 
of the center pivot was 3,200 liters per minute, which is 850 gallons uh, per minute. Uh, pathogen concentrations mimicked what I had determined uh, via qPCR. So they range from 10 to the third to 10 to the sixth in the very high risk scenario. Uh, wastewater percentage range from 5 to 20 percent, which is pretty typical for uh, most uh, wastewaters blended with irrigation water for center pivot. Uh, sprinkler impact is the impact of um, the release from the sprinkler on the pathogen viability. And from some of my own research, I determined that there was very little impact of uh, sprinkler. So I set everything to zero. Aerosolization efficiency was set from 0 0.1 to 3. Um, and that, those values were obtained from the literature and from, from uh, uh, some of my own research uh, using potassium bromide as a uh, tracer. And then when we're all done and said, um, you come up with the pathogen emission rates and cells per second. So they range from 27 cells released per second from the full pivot section and to um, three, 3 million cells per second. You'll have to forgive me. I'm, I'm a little bit messed up with the delay. <laughs> So uh, this is just an example slide of some of the sensitivity analyses that um, I conducted. Um, sensitivity analysis, you put a lot of factor, you know, inputs into the model to see how the model, you know, the model outputs, um, how the model reacts to the model inputs, and then you can look at the outputs. Um, so over here, I was just looking at averaging period in air mod. And so if you use an averaging period of one hour, your air concentration of the pathogen is higher. Um, and obviously, if your averaging period increases from 3 to 24, your downwind concentrations decrease. So in the end, I wound up just choosing a three-hour averaging period to, to provide something that was somewhat conservative. Um, and on the right, this is just the um, effect of um, emission rate in the model. And at, with 3 million cells uh, released per second, you obviously have a much higher downwind uh, concentration than with the lower emission rates. And you see the, the decrease is an exponential decrease with distance from the center pivot. So as with uh, any modeling exercise, you have assumptions. Um, so for this e exercise, um, all bioaerosols were assumed to be 100 micrometers in aerodynamic diameter or less. Uh, the density was set at 1.1 grams per cubic centimeter. Only dry deposition was considered. And I assume that the deposition behavior among pathogens was similar. Um, I also considered inactivation of airborne pathogens. And I'll talk about that in the next slide or two. And aerosol age, which is need to correct for inactivation, was based on an average wind speed of 4.4 meters per second. So you'll notice 4.4 is about 9 miles an hour. Idaho is a pretty windy place. So here is the um, formula used to calculate die-off, microorganism die-off. So lambda is the viability decay rate. Um, A sub D is the aerosol age, which I just talked about. And the aerosol age ranged um, from 3.8 to 38 minutes based on that 4.4 uh, meters per second wind speed. So to account for daytime or nighttime conditions, uh, respective decay rates of 0.7 or 0.02 per second were used. And they were obtained from the literature and is based on information on E. coli. So, so I'll just walk you through this. These are box, pl box plots. And for the risk of infection after one hour of exposure, 
um, at one kilometer downwind during daytime applications of wastewater. So on the y-axis, we have the log risk of infection. Um, down here on the x are the organisms, and you probably can't see that from where you are. Um, and we have scenario A, B, C, and D. And then I drew a line across here at minus six, so that would be a one and one million risk of infection. Um, I, just, I chose that just because it's, it's pretty commonly used in some of the cancer literature and um, some of the other infectious risk studies. So it's a pretty conservative, um, and there is no set uh, rule on what you know, um, threshold you should use, but I picked one in one million. So, but you can see if you're one kilometer downwind, um, you're well below, so it's very low risk. In fact, there's a very low risk of uh, infection from any of these organisms um, when you're one kilometer, one kilometer downwind. So at nighttime, um, things change a little bit. Now notice um, up here I have one, five, and ten, and then one, five, and ten kilometers downwind. So um, this would be one kilometer, five kilometers, ten kilometers downwind. And once again, we have the scenarios A, B, C, D. And so scenario A, um, the risk for these bacteria, or risk of infection from these bacteria, um, is, is very low. It's below one in one million. But of course, as we go to the higher risk scenarios, you start um, pushing some of the risks up uh, for the bacteria. And then by the time you get to scenario D, where you're applying 20% wastewater, um, even if you're uh, 10 kilometers downwind, there's a, a higher risk of infection. So here I just wanted to walk you through some of the individual pathogens and the estimates. So what we have here, once again, scenario A, B, C, and D. And then what I put here, those one hour, eight hour, 24, and the multi-day exposure. And here's the log risk of infection. And here's our one in one million uh, risk of infection. And so um, for Campolu Jujuni, one kilometer, daytime uh, exposure, um, pretty much the risk of infection is very low and it's much, much lower than one in one million. But you will notice, to so just point out that, you know, here's a one hour exposure, eight and 24. So your risk of exposure, your risk of infection, sorry, um, increases obviously as your exposure time increases. So for Campylobacter dejuni at nighttime, um, the model estimates that um, your risk of infection will be greater than one in one million. So it doesn't matter if you're, um, you know, one hour exposure, 24 hours exposure. Um, if you're one kilometer downwind at nighttime, um, you have a fairly high risk of infection. And I'll just point out that I'm not going to show all the bacteria, but the results um, for E. coli 0157 and uh, Listeria were very similar to the Campylobacter dejuni results. And that's because the um, dose response factors are very similar for those organisms to Campylobacter. So for E. coli non-0157, so it's a Shinka toxigenic, toxigenic E. coli, um, for exposure scenario A, I have a little asterisk there because the risk of infection was basically near zero, um, but your risk of infection is increasing as you go to the different scenarios. However, um, all the risks were predicted to be less than one in one million. Um, at nighttime, one kilometer downwind for non-0157, the risk was lower than one in one million. Um, but as you increase the amount of wastewater, 
uh, during the uh, irrigation event. So you've got, uh, I think it's 10% and 20% here. Um, your risk of infection goes above, uh, it's greater than one in one million. So you see the same trend here. Salmonella, um, infectious risks were less than one in a million. And just point out that it's one kilometer, so obviously if you're five kilometers or 10 kilometers downwind, your risk is going to be a lot lower. And um, at nighttime for salmonella, your risks were generally uh, greater than one in one million. So I'll wrap it up. So as you can tell, and you probably know, risk assessment is not an exact science. Um, but I believe that this uh, quantitative microbial risk assessment provides a useful starting point to understand and manage infectious risks associated with the spray irrigation of dairy wastewaters. So residential populations that are greater than one kilometer downwind should have a very low risk of infection during daytime applications. Um, infection risks however, will likely be higher during nighttime applications. But I will point out that infection does not ex mean disease. Um, so my recommendations uh, based on the results from uh, this exercise would be that uh, wastewater should be applied during daylight hours when dilution and microbial die-off are highest. And it would also be advisable to apply the lowest possible percentage of wastewater to decrease the number of aerosolized pathogens. So thanks for your time.